Thank you very much. It's good to see everybody here this evening. I am the second part of the program this evening, and the second part of the program is not just historical, but it's also biblical. For those of you who do not understand Bible prophecy and have had no introduction to it, you will get it tonight. In Revelation of your Bible, chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13 in the Bible, it talks about a rise of an end-time world government. The reason why we know it's an end-time world government is that this particular government will fight an individual who claims to be the son of the living God, the true God of the universe. His name is Jesus Christ. In Revelation 13, verse 1 and 2, I'll read parts of it. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea. A beast in Bible prophecy, both in the book of Daniel and Revelation, is a world government. Drop down now to verse 2 and let's see where it gets its power. The middle part of the verse. And the dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. In Revelation 12, verse 9, and this is something you need to know about Bible, the Bible, it always interprets itself. It says very clearly that this dragon is Satan the devil. An unseen spirit entity, his name was originally Lucifer, a cherub that covered the very throne of God, and he rebelled against God because he wanted to be worshipped as God. And therefore he came into competition with God and wanted to destroy his plan and his creative work. Verse 4 of Revelation 13, the latter part of the verse, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? I will get into tonight and tomorrow in the history of the Illuminati what this means, and it's in your lifetime today. It is before your eyes on television every single day right now in the United Nations organization that George Bush constantly talks about. Verse 7 and 8, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. This means persecution of those who worship Jesus Christ and are followers of him. And that means martyrdom, even though many people don't like to face it. It's going to happen. Not one Christian has been exempted in the times of past. Why should they be today? There is coming a time of testing to find out where the hearts of men really lie. And it shows that it will be a complete world government. It says, power was given unto him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations, all, none excluded. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names were not written in the book of life from the, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So this beast government will rise. He will sit in the temple of God, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 through 4. He will claim to be God on earth. And all people of all nations will be required to worship him as God. Anyone who will not will be targeted for extinction. Read all New Age literature and you will find this is exactly what they say. Also in New Age literature, they say there is coming a time when they'll have a sophisticated barter system. It will not be using money and cash and checks as we do today. Notice what it says in the book of Revelation, and let's see if this book is up to date. Verse 16, And it causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads. Go to the grocery store and look at all the marks and symbols on products today, and they run them across scanners, don't they? Verse 17, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the number of the beast, or the number of his name. So there is coming a sophisticated barter system in which all people of the earth will be required to enter into it and you will only be able to enter into this new age if you accept the Illuminati's illuminated or enlightened one. Let's go back now and see if there really is an Illuminati. Let's go back and see if there really is individuals who are working for world government and if they have plotted out their course of action, in some cases, 200 years in advance. Other cases, 100 years in advance. The German rationalist openly attacked all the establishment beliefs. This is the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages. Then the Protestants that came along after them, they felt that religion in any form was weird. 
and they believed that the only way to turn the human race around was by the extinction of the belief in God and that man himself was to be worshipped as God. This was back in the 1730s, 1740s. Another authority defined rationalism as, and I quote, that manner of thought by which the human reason is considered to be the only source and the only judge of all kinds of knowledge, end of quote. That was the book, Der Rationalism. It was published in Europe. There are individuals who feel that they are enlightened. They are the intelligentsia. These individuals first spawned in Europe and they created a ultra secret organization called the Illuminati. The word Illuminati literally means the enlightened ones, those who have the answer to all problems. They can run banks, educational systems, governments. They have been enlightened by Lucifer, whom they claim is the very individual who is now working and guiding all nations into a one world government and his adepts, those who worship Lucifer by name, will be those ruling this government. Anyone who understands what the gospel of Jesus Christ is, the good news that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, will recognize instantly Lucifer is counterfeiting God Almighty's program. Counterfeiting. No wonder it said all will worship the beast. The greatest hoax is about to be perpetrated on the human race that has ever existed. The Order of the Illuminati was founded on May 1st, 1776 by a Dr. Adam Weishaupt. Dr. Weishaupt was born with Jewish parents. He then joined the Catholic Church. He was a professor of canon law at the University of Ingolstadt in Bavaria, Germany. He later abandoned that order. He started his own order of the Illuminati. And this is where we're going to start with this particular program. It's very important that we clarify the real meaning of the name of Weishaupt's secret society, the Illuminati. I've mentioned it already. The name implies that those individuals who are members of the Illuminati are members of the human race who are truly enlightened. They are the ones that Lucifer has given special knowledge to that no one else on earth has. Weishaupt and his followers came from the cream of the crop in Europe, the intelligentsia. They were the people who had the great mental capacity of their day. They had great knowledge, insight, understanding on how to run governments. And ultimately, they said to bring peace to the world. Their slogan became fraternity, brotherhood. And what do we hear out of certain organizations if you have been a member of those organizations like Freemasonry, don't they say fraternity, brotherhood, equality? That was the slogan of the Illuminati. Their avowed goal and purpose was to establish, and look at these words carefully, a novus ordo seclorum. That means a new world order or world government. Now the name Illuminati is derived from Lucifer, which means bearer of the light or light bringer. And if you read Isaiah chapter 14, starting in verse 12, you'll see that Lucifer is the one that fell in rebellion to God. Illuminism is clearly Satanism, only in its latter day manifestations. Satan, to be exact, was the first Illuminist. He became illuminated out from under the rule of law of God Almighty. And when I close tonight, I'm not going to leave you empty and say, what should I do? I'm going to show you from the one book of all knowledge that is the chief upon which all other knowledge is founded, why the world is in the state it is. Why the Illuminati has been able to exist. Why they're promoting world government. Why every evil is taking place today you will know before you leave. Public attention was first drawn to the existence of the Illuminati and their plan for world conquest in an accident in 1785. History records that there was a courier for the Illuminati by the name of Lands. He was traveling from Frankfurt to Paris. 
He had on his body specific instructions for the French Revolution. And something very strange happened. He was struck by lightning. All the papers talking about the French Revolution and the plan for world government were confiscated by the local police. They were turned over to the Bavarian government of Germany. This gave the plans as a worldwide conspiracy, and that's their word. Satan the devil, whose former name was Lucifer, was the first conspiracy against God. And he's been running his program in history, and you cannot understand what has happened in history unless you understand there is not just the physical, but there is a spiritual world. And that's where the major battles are taking place. And you and I are the pawns in the hand of Lucifer and his attendants. All of the carefully documented evidence was brought to the attention of the governments of Britain, Germany, Austria, France, Poland, and Russia. Every one of those nations, for some reason or another, failed to act upon the information given. I personally believe that the Illuminati had already gained such control by infiltration that they were the ones who discarded in each of these governments this information. So nothing was acted upon it. Four years after this, the French Revolution exploded on the scene. One third of the population was exterminated just like the Illuminati says must happen to the population of planet Earth because there's not enough natural resources to go around in the latter part of the 20th century to feed five billion people. They have already recommended the elimination of over two billion people. And I believe the war that has now started in the Middle East, as Muammar Gaddafi said, this is the beginning of World War III. I believe they're going to annihilate the Muslims. Sir Walter Scott, in his second volume of The Life of Napoleon, points out that events that were leading up to the French Revolution were all created by money people, money barons. And it was they, the people who ran the banking houses and who had the money, that influenced the mobs that overthrew the French government and then who headed up the reign of terror that followed in that country. The first real break concerning information, inside information concerning the Illuminati, came when Adam Weishaupt went over to England and he discussed the Illuminati and its plans with a Professor John Robison and he wanted him to join in the Illuminati because Professor Robinson was one of the most distinguished men in all of England. Mr. Robinson, strictly in his own mind, listened to Mr. Weishaupt. He didn't believe that the goals of the Illuminati were to create a one world government for the good of mankind. Adam Weishaupt misread the intentions of John Robinson and he left with him the documentation that the Bavarian government also had confiscated. So John Robinson published a book later on in which he entitled it Proofs of a Conspiracy. It was published in 1797. Much of his material was taken from the Bavarian government's report about the Illuminati. And it showed basically that they were going to create a Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new world order. Adam Weishaupt actually constructed the machinery to put this into operation before he died. All initiates into this particular order were required to take an oath to bind themselves to ultimate secrecy. I want to quote part of that oath. To perpetual silence and unshakable loyalty and submission to the order. Notice, absolute submission. You could never discuss the order of the Illuminati with anyone who was not another member of that secret organization. In the persons of my superiors, here making a faithful and complete surrender of my private judgment, my own will and every narrow-minded employment of my own power and influence. When you went into the order of the Illuminati, you no longer thought for yourself. Orders were handed down to you, you must obey them blindly. No matter what you thought of them, you were obligated upon the threat 
of extermination. I'll continue the pledge that a person had to take. I pledge myself to account the good of the order as my own good and am ready to serve it with my fortune. Every dime they had was given to the Illuminati and to advance its causes. My honor and my blood. The friends and enemies of the order shall be my friends and enemies. And with respect to both, that's friends and enemies, I will conduct myself as directed by the order and devote myself to its increase and promotion and therein to employ all my ability without secret reservation. End of quote. That was taken from the Proofs of Conspiracy by John Robinson, the 1967 edition, page 71. So there was a conspiracy, and that conspiracy was so lethal to anyone who knew it, they must submit to it or be exterminated. No one could leak the secrets and remain alive. There was a warning that was given to those who went into the order. The initiate took part in a ceremony. Here's what they were warned, quote, If you are only a traitor and perjurer, learn that all our brothers are called upon to arm themselves against you. Do not hope to escape or to find a place of safety. Wherever you are, shame, remorse, and the rage of our brothers will pursue you and torment you to the innermost recesses of your entrails. End of quote. That came from the book, World Revolution by Nesta Webster, published in London, England in 1921, page 14. So there are those who ultimately are working for world government. They will never admit it. They must stand publicly and say that they are for America, they're for England, they're for whatever the nation it is they reside in. And when they get into office, they must work at the orders of someone else. Why do you think Mr. Jimmy Carter turned gray and wrinkled in four short years? I'll continue. By the time a person came inside and understood the ultimate secrets of the Illuminati, he had taken an oath of absolute obedience. Only then did he learn the ultimate goals of that order. They are, number one, the abolition of all ordered government. Destruction of all governments. Build them from the bottom up. Number two, the ab abolition of private property. Everything would be owned by the state. Number three, abolition of inheritance. That way no wealth can be handed down from one generation to another. Check your income tax forms this year and next year and see if that's not going into effect. Number four, abolition of patriotism. We're not citizens of the United States. We're world citizens, according to Governor Thompson of Illinois. Number five, abolition of all religion. Is there anyone in America today that stands up for God Almighty and the absolute truth? Which church do you go to to find it? Have they done their job well? Number six, the abolition of the family. Marriage, morality, proper education of children destroyed so that you can reduce the people to serfs. They're much easier to control when they're uneducated. What about our educational system today? You think about it. Number seven, the final objective was the creation of a world government. Naturally, most members were never allowed to understand the real goals of the order. No one in any Freemasonic organization understands these things unless they're hand-picked. And I will prove that from the statements of Albert Pike, head of all Freemasonry all over the world. Adam Weishaupt had a very subtle but clear-cut plan to destroy religion. I quote, I have contrived an explanation which has every advantage in inviting to, it is inviting to Christians of every communion. In other words, Christians will literally believe that this thing that they're doing is right. Did Jesus Christ say in Matthew 24, if you know your Bible, the number one thing to watch for that His coming was imminent was that deception would be to the many, not a few? 
but to the masses of humanity. And here is a man who worshipped Lucifer by name and said he had contrived a plan by which even Christians will be able to join and think they were doing God a service. He said, I'll continue the quote, which will gradually free them from all religious prejudices. I've talked to several people before this meeting started tonight and they were telling me about their religious affiliations and how they're now accepting everything that's anti-biblical, homosexuality and so on, every foul and degenerate thing that is against God, their churches now accept it and promote it. Didn't Adam Weishaupt say he would do it? Yes, he did. Cultivate the social virtues. And he said that he would give universal happiness without religion. All this was found once again in the book Proofs of a Conspiracy, page 64. This plan proved to be very successful, and it was only given out to those of the higher ranks. No one in the lower ranks of the Illuminati were ever to know the real program that was to be brought about. I want to give another quote now from World Revolution by Nesta Webster, page 13. The most admirable thing of all, this was Weishaupt's own statement, is that great Protestants and Reformed theologians, and he was referring to the Lutherans and the Calvinists in Germany, who belong to our order, really believe they see in it the true and genuine mind of the Christian religion. Oh man, he says, what cannot you be bought, brought to believe? End of quote. Deception. If you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. Now do you see why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good? If you don't prove what you believe, how do you know it's true? How do you know you're not being deceived? Adam Weishaupt demanded blind obedience to the party line. He was the first dictator of the Illuminati. Lies were a part of his program to advance the cause. He had no scruples, none whatsoever. He wrote, and I quote, these people swell our numbers. These are just the average person that comes into the ranks of the Illuminati and other Freemasonic organizations. They just swell the numbers and fill our treasury. I'm going to prove before I'm through that anyone who belongs to a Freemasonic organization, they're swelling the treasury of those who are trying to enslave the world. You should leave that organization immediately and never set foot in it again and get down on your knees and beg God Almighty to forgive you for the ignorance of not knowing what happens in the highest echelons of Freemasonry. I'll continue. Get busy and make these people nibble at our bait, but do not tell them our secrets. You see, there was a conspiracy. Only the highest individuals knew what the purpose of the Illuminati was. The Protestant princes of Europe, the rulers of Germany and of Europe, were very pleased at Adam Weishaupt's plan to destroy the Catholic Church. What they didn't realize was he had plans to destroy their churches too, and all churches on the face of the earth. A very significant thing happened in the year 1782. Historians will never write about it. They don't understand it. But on the 16th of July, 1782, at the Congress of Wilhelmsbad, an alliance between the Illuminati and worldwide Freemasonry was sealed. This pact joined together all leading societies on the earth of that day. Over three million people on the rolls of those Freemasonic organizations and the Illuminati they merged. I want to give a quote now that was found in World Revolution by Nesta Webster, page 18, concerning a man who attended that particular Congress. Quote, what passed at this terrible Congress will never be known to the outside world. 
For even those men who had been drawn unwittingly into the movement and now heard for the first time the real designs of the leaders were under oath to reveal nothing. One honest Freemason, the Conte de Vero, when questioned about the tragic secrets he had brought back with him, replied, I will not confide them to you. I can only tell you that all this is very much more serious than you think. The conspiracy, his word, which has been woven is so well thought out that it will be, so to speak, impossible for the monarchy, that's kings of Europe, and the church, the Catholic church, to escape from it. From that time on, says his biography, the Conte di Vero could only speak of Freemasonry with horror. End of quote. Most people from the 32nd degree and lower never know what is going on. You must be hand-picked as Mr. Ronald Reagan was for an honorary 33rd degree to have the secrets revealed to you. During the next few years after 1782 and the Illuminati and Freemasonry merged on the very highest levels, there was a strong movement which finally emancipated the Jews in Europe. For the first time ever now, the Jews were allowed to enter into Freemasonry. So of course they started their own Masonic Lodge also. The reason why the Illuminati wanted to do this was because international banking had already started. And those in high finance, they wanted to be on their side to finance world revolution. So the Illuminati brought into it people like Mayor Angel Rothschild, who started the first international banking concern, if you want to get technical, in modern day, in the last 200 years. The order expanded very rapidly. And when this happens, there's usually dissension in the ranks. As a direct result, the right-hand man of Adam Weishaupt, a Mr. Krieg, and two of his other associates tried to usurp some of Weishaupt's authority. And of course, they were relieved of their position. People at that time became very intensely aware of the activities of the Illuminati. Others of their organization left. In 1785, four leading members left. They began to talk and literally testified in a court of inquiry that was called by the Elector of Bavaria. They gave very startling evidence as to the intensity and the long-range plans of the Illuminati. Here's what they said. They planned to bring about, and I quote, a universal revolution that should deal the death blow to society. This revolution will be the work of the secret societies. And that is one of our great mysteries. End of quote. Does anyone belong to a secret society? What have you got to hide? Jesus Christ is the light of the world. There's nothing to hide there. So the danger of the Illuminati became very clear to the Bavarian government. They decided to put out legal documents and send it all over the continent. They were called and entitled the original writings of the order and sect of the Illuminati. All those governments in Europe were sent a copy, but somehow they paid little to no attention to it. And that's why the order continued. It now became very important more important than ever before that the name Illuminati be erased from the history books. So what happened was this. They printed instructions to members of the Illuminati. Here's what it says, quote, the great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Nobody knows it exists. Things happen but nobody knows why they happen. I'll continue. Never let it, the name, order of the Illuminati, appear in any place in its own name. Many of you here tonight have never heard the word Illuminati. 
And yet here the founders said, don't ever let the name Illuminati be known to the public. This way people will think the Illuminati died when the Bavarian government cracked down on it and caused the leaders to flee from Bavaria, Germany. But always let it be covered by another name and another occupation. End of quote. John Robinson in his Conspiracy, page 195. So before I'm through, tonight and tomorrow, I will show you the exact detailed program of the Illuminati and many of its manifestations right up to the very moment that we're talking today and tomorrow. And you will know by their program that they are a part of the Illuminati. Even though they use different names, they'll never let you know what really happened. Now the order of the, order of the Illuminati started in 1776, May 1st. Does anybody realize that every communist nation in the world has what is called May Day? May 1st, every year they have great celebrations. Even a church college that I attended has the celebration on their campus every year. They don't know why they're doing it, but it's the celebration of the founding of the Illuminati and the beginning of its final 200 year struggle to develop the new order of the ages that they state they want intact by the year 2000. However, before the colonies even had an opportunity to unite, the Constitution of the United States was not yet adopted and our Republic was not yet established in its fullness. Fifteen lodges of the Order of the Illuminati were formed in the 13 colonies. The Columbian Lodge of the Order of the Illuminati was established in New York City. Certain members included Governor DeWitt Clinton, Clinton Roosevelt, Charles Dana, and Horace Greeley. Those names most people learn in history. They were members of the Order of the Illuminati. The following year, a lodge was established in Virginia. There was one notable person that was attached to that lodge. His name was Thomas Jefferson. When Adam Weishaupt's plans were exposed by the Bavarian government, Thomas Jefferson in the United States strongly defended Adam Weishaupt as an enthusiastic philanthropist. Those were the writings, their words, not mine. Many strong warnings in the United States began to be issued about the activities of the Illuminati. On July 19, 1798, David Papin, who was president of Harvard University, issued a strong warning to the graduating class of that year and lectured them on the influence that the Illuminati was already having on the American scene. President, president Timothy Dwight of Yale University issued a similar warning upon their graduating class. In 1798, another man that most Americans are familiar with sent a letter to Mr. G.W. Snyder. The man who wrote the letter was George Washington. Here's what he said, quote, it is my intention to, it is not my intention to doubt that the doctrine of the Illuminati and the principles of Jacobinism had not been spread in the United States. On the contrary, no one is more satisfied of this fact than I am. George Washington knew the doctrine of the Illuminati had already been planted in the shores of America. It was to be the new bastion in which they would spread to the rest of the world. I'll continue his quote. The idea I meant to convey was that I did not believe the Lodge of Freemasons in this country had as societies endeavored to propagate the diabolical tenets. In other words, the average person in the Freemasons, he didn't believe was a part of it. It was only the higher ranks that were promoting this type of diabolical plot. I'll continue. That individuals of them may have done it or that the founder or instruments employed to found the democratic societies in the United States may have had this object. In other words, only the founders of the lodges and the high-ranking individuals 
and even high-ranking individuals of our democratic government may also have had the idea of the Illuminati's plan for world government. All this information was found in the writings of George Washington and of all things published by the United States Government Printing Office in 1941. Volume 20, page 518. So the plan of the Illuminati was known by George Washington and the founders of this nation. Isn't it interesting that Washington, D.C., all the strategic points in it make up free Masonic symbols? The whole city is laid out with all the symbols of Freemasonry. Interesting, but it's absolutely factual. That's the truth. The fact that George Washington was concerned about the Illuminati in the United States was demonstrated in his farewell speech that was delivered on September 17, 1796. This document, in my opinion, ranks second only to the Constitution of the United States of national importance. He expressed his heartfelt wish that, and I quote, heaven may continue to give you the choicest tokens of its benefit, benefits. All obstructions to the ex execution of the laws, all combinations and associations. Now their language was a little different back there. What he is actually saying is all secret societies, all government boards, or not government, but corporation boards, under whatever plausible character, with the real design to direct, control, and counteract, or the regular deliberation and action of the constituted authorities are destructive of this fundamental principle and of fatal tendency. He's saying any secret society, any corporation such as international bankers that usurp the authority of government are fatal to our republican form of government. He went on to say, such combinations and associations are likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government. And then he went on to say, destroying the very engine of government that gave them their wealth and power. I think this is very important for us to understand because he knew the doctrine of the Illuminati. They would infiltrate in secret, pretend to be for America, and then as quickly as possible pass legislation to socialize us. Mr. John Robinson published his Proofs of a Conspiracy in 1798 in which he warned about the Illuminati infiltration into Masonic lodges. In 1796, Mr. John Adams who had been instrumental in organizing Masonic Lodges in New England, direct, decided to oppose Thomas Jefferson in his bid for the presidency. He made a major issue that Thomas Jefferson had been the minister of France in, from 1785 to 1789, and that Thomas Jefferson spoke very sympathetically toward the Illuminati reign of terror in that country. He used this in the campaign in which John Quincy Adams wrote three letters to a Colonel William L. Stone giving details of those charges. This information is what led to the defeat of Thomas Jefferson at that time. These were found and they were in the Rittenberg Square Library in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for many years. Now they've mysteriously vanished. No one seems to know what happens to them. In 1826, a Mr. William Morgan, who was a very high-ranking Freemason, decided that it was his duty to write a book showing the connection between Freemasonry and the Illuminati in the United States. So, Morgan, I quote, 
who had passed through all the degrees of masonry and held a very high position in the order, began to write a book. He arranged with a printer in Batavia to have the book published. Notice, quote, he was engaged in completing it when he was arrested on a false charge of larceny. His house was searched and his manuscripts were seized and destroyed. Then notice what happened. A couple of days later, he was released from jail. And now I'm writing and quoting. He was released by the interference of some of the conspirators. He was then kidnapped. He was taken out in a boat under Lake Erie, or Lake Ontario, I'm sorry. Weights were put on both his feet and hands, and he was dumped into the lake. One year later, his body was found. As a direct result of this, about 40% of all people in Freemasonry in the northern jurisdiction of the United States left Freemasonry. All this information was found in the book Irish and English Freemasons by a Mr. Gargano, page 73. Now it's difficult from time to time to give a clear picture of the activities of the Illuminati because they followed their founder, Adam Weishaupt's instructions very clearly. Adam Weishaupt said you must conceal the name order of the Illuminati. Go by another name. And then if that name begins to be suspect, then get another name. And just go from name to name so that it'll be difficult to trace you through history. In order for us to further trace the Illuminati up to the present day, the only way we can do it is to find those groups, secret organizations, that actually preach and teach the identical program of Adam Weishaupt. If it's there and they're trying to build a Novus Ordo Seclorum, then and only then can you know that they're a part of the Illuminati. In 1829, an American Illuminist sponsored a series of lectures in New York by an English Illuminist by the name of Frances Fanny Wright. She advocated the entire Weishaupian program, and it included, for the first time, a new name, a name called communism. For the first time now, the Illuminati was going to go by the slogan in order to promote themselves. Listen carefully, those of you who are living in the latter part of the 20th century. This was 1829, and tell me if you hear it. They wanted to make this socialism, communism, this novus ordo seclorum more palatable, more acceptable to people like you and me by using phrases such as equal opportunity, equal rights, atheism, emancipation of women, and free love. Anybody heard of those lately? If you're not dead, you've heard of them. <laughs> those present at that meeting in 1829 were informed that the Illuminati intended to unite all revolutionary groups all over the world and all atheistic groups under a new name that would be called the International Communist Movement. This new destructive force was to be used by the Illuminati to foment future revolutions. Now do we know why Matthew 24 says, You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nations shall rise against nations. Because it was planned in 1829. But they had to have a country first that was communistic, that could build a military, that could field soldiers, that could train people to infiltrate other governments and foment revolution. Individuals in the United States who were to be the directors for raising money for this cause was Clinton Roosevelt, direct ancestor of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who happened to be the first man to implement socialist 
and Socialism in America. Then Mr. Charles Dana and Horace Greeley. Roosevelt and his group were to pose as the champions of the working class. They advocated noble and worthy causes so that there would be no suspicion. And in their early writings, Mr. Roosevelt showed exactly what he had in mind. Here's what he said about the United States Constitution. They declared that their intention was, and I quote, to kick the money lenders out of the temple. This was their good side. But notice what else he wrote in his book when he published it. It was called The Science of Government. Here's what he said. Arts, sciences, and religions must be abolished and replaced by the socialist science of government. End of quote. Wasn't that exactly what Adam Weishaupt said? He said we must destroy religion and governments and build them from the ground up. He showed himself to be an enlightened one by all of the statements he made in his book. He said that the United States Constitution was nothing more than a leaky vessel that was hastily put together when we left the British flag. He went on to declare his contempt for God, the creator of the universe. And he declared, and I quote from his book, There is no God of justice to order things aright on earth. If there be a God, he is a malicious and revengeful being who created us for misery. End of quote. Then he goes on and he lets it all hang out. He, he showed by his book that his intention was a new world order in which the old world order, and I hope people know what that order was, during the Middle Ages, it was supposedly Christian in name. And they at least, in a few places, had Bibles that were nailed down to the podiums in certain places where occasionally somebody could go and read one. That is, if you had an education. So he's saying we must eliminate the old order of Christianity and destroy religion. In 1830, Adam Weishaupt, founder of the Illuminati, died at age 82. In an effort to convince the world that the Illuminati and Illuminism was truly dead, he actually called for a priest. He confessed and repented. Of course, you and I know that that's a hoax. He didn't do it, but he wanted the world to think so. In 1834, a man by the name of Giuseppe Massini he was an Italian revolutionary leader. He was appointed by the Illuminati as the director of revolutionary programs all over the world. He held that position until he died in 1872. About the same time, a very obscure intellectual by the name of Moses Mordecai Marx Levy, alias Karl Marx, join one of the branches of the Illuminati called the Order of the Just. In 1847, he was hired by the House of Rothschild to write what later became known as the Communist Manifesto. Now, to show you the insignificance of Karl Marx, who incidentally let a couple of his children die of starvation, malnutrition, and so on, because he never held a job in his life. But anyway, it was 20 years after the writing of this program and this book before his name was attached to it. That's how insignificant he was in the overall program of the Illuminati. You see, the Illuminati stays behind the scenes. They're never to be seen. They only put other stooges, and that's their word, out in the limelight to take all the responsibility for their actions behind the scenes. So Karl Marx was a totally insignificant person. He was simply hired to plagiarize the original writings of Adam Weishaupt and bring it up to date. The next important personality to emerge on the American scene 
as a leader in the Luciferian conspiracy was Albert Pike. If you were to go a few blocks from the Capitol in Washington, D.C., you would find a Masonic temple there, and Albert Pike's body is enshrined there. What about this man? He was born in Boston, Massachusetts, December 29, 1809. He went on to Harvard, received a degree. Albert Pike was an evil genius of the first magnitude. He was a man who had many talents. He always used them on the side of evil. Always. He was very literate. He spoke 16 ancient languages. He read those languages also. He was an avowed worshiper of Satan. He practiced necromancy and all forms of sorcery. As top illuminist, Albert Pike and Giuseppe Massini worked in unison. Albert Pike took control of the theosophical or the religious side of Freemasonry. I know there are those who don't believe there is a religious side to Freemasonry, but I've read the books of 32nd and 33rd degree Masons, and they all say it's a religion. And when I give you a quote in just a moment, if there's any doubter, you'll never doubt again. It's right out of Albert Pike's book, Morals and Dogma. Pike took up the religious part. Giuseppe then took charge of the political, the revolutionary side of the, of the Illuminati. When the Grand Orient Lodges in Europe became suspect because of Massini's revolutionary activities, Massini presented a master plan to Albert Pike, who at this time had already become the head of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the United States and the world. Giuseppe Massini's plan was very simple. He was a practical man. He knew that all the different lodges of Freemasonry would not accept merging them all together. In a letter to Albert Pike dated January 22, 1870, Giuseppe Massini wrote, quote, We must allow all the federations of Freemasonry to continue just as they are with their systems, their central authorities, and their diverse modes of correspondence between high grades of the same right. Organized as they are at present, then he puts in a little three-letter word, but we must create a super right which will remain unknown to which we will call those Masons of high degree who we shall select. With regard to our brothers in Masonry, these men must be pledges to the strictest secrecy. Through this supreme right, we will govern all free masonry, which will become the one international center, the more powerful because its directions will be unknown. End of quote. That was found in the book Occult Theocracy by Lady Queensborough of England, page 208-209. So now Albert Pike and Giuseppe Massini has created a super right over all other Masonic lodges and nobody knew it existed except the individuals they selected. Here is an ultra-secret organization now controlling Freemasonry. The average Mason doesn't even know what's going on. Pike organized this ultra-secret organization under the name of the New and Reform Palladian Rite. That is what governs Freemasonry all over the world. He established three supreme councils, one in Charleston, South Carolina, one in Rome, Italy, and another in Berlin, Germany. A historian, Dr. Batelli, wrote, and I quote, this super right, which is Masonic Luciferian spiritism, must not be confused with the machinery of high masonry. Palladism is the cult of Satan in the inner shrines of a right superimposed on all rights. It is a cult, a religion. End of quote. And his book was a French name that I'll not try to pronounce. 
So we can see that this high order of Freemasonry now was to be secret. It was to rule the whole world, all Masons, all over the world without their knowledge of it. One of Albert Pike's most famous works was his 861 page Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. It was published in 1871. He said that there must be a supreme pontiff of universal Freemasonry. He was it. He told what he had in mind and what all people of the Palladian Rite had to look forward to in the future. He said force unregulated is not only wasted in a void like that of gunpowder burned in an open air. He said we must use the force that we have for purposes. He went on to say what that purpose was. I'll quote, It is destruction and ruin, not growth and progress. Why would they want destruction and ruin, not growth and progress? Because if it's growth and progress outside the hands of the Illuminati, they're not in control. So if they get all forces in their hands, then they uneducate the populace, then they can control them. They state so in their own writings. That's why our schools produce illiterates, but they have a certificate in their hands. It's deliberate. The billions that are taken from us in taxes is not to educate our children, it's to train new social minds that will fit into the new world order by the year 2000. The theology or religion of Albert Pike was laid bare by himself. He wrote something called Instructions. This was dated July 14th, 1889. He wrote it to the 23 supreme councils of the world. I quote, That which we must say to the crowd is, in other words, everybody on earth plus all the lesser degrees in Freemasonry, We've got to say this to them. We worship a God, but it is the God one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign grand instructor generals, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. He said, look, I'm writing this to you so that you can repeat what I'm saying to the others in the lesser degrees of Freemasonry. Oh, we believe in a God. Now look what he said. The Masonic religion should be by all of us initiates of the high degrees maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Can it be clearer? If you worship Lucifer, you don't worship the creator God of the universe. It's either one or the other. You cannot have both. He went on and said, I'm continuing his quote, the doctrine of Satanism is a heresy. He said, look, that's a heresy. And the true and pure philosophic religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. And he goes on and shows that he believes there's two gods, a god of light, that's Lucifer, and a god of evil, that's the god the Christians worship. Now do you understand why every country on the face of the earth where communism takes over, they systematically kill Christians? Because they think we're following the God of evil and we're committing idolatry. It makes sense now, doesn't it? Oh yes. They worship the devil. What did it say in Revelation 13 too? Who was giving power to the rise of this end time system? Satan, the devil. Illuminati propaganda would actually have you and me to believe that those who oppose Christianity are atheists. Some of them are. But the leaders of atheism is not 
they worship Lucifer. They have a religion. It's deliberately contrived and fostered because they want us to believe that they are atheists and do not worship Lucifer because we would never fall for any of their programs. In a very remarkable letter that was dated August 15th, 1871, this was on display in the British Museum Library in London, England for a long time. That's where all this documentation was picked up by writers of books in England. Albert Pike gave Giuseppe Massini details of the final Luciferian plan for world conquest. In very graphic detail, he stated there must be at least two great revolutions, two world wars, many smaller revolutions, and possibly a third world war. He stated that in the third of these wars, I quote, we shall unleash the nihilist and the atheist. You see, the communists are only pawns in their hands. And we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm which in all of its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism and of the most bloody turmoil. They actually planned the Third World War to be so bloody and so powerful that all people on earth will finally throw up their hands and say, give us a world government or else we'll all be annihilated. But that's not all. Listen to what else he said in this very remarkable letter. Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and listen to this the multitudes disillusioned with Christianity why I heard today before this sitting out front in the lobby of this hotel Somebody say, how could a God let such things happen that's going on in the Middle East? Disillusion with Christianity because of all the bloodshed brought on by the devil. And then he went on to say, but these masses will not know who to worship because they do have a deistic spirit. Then he said, we, they'll receive the pure light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out into the public view. Do we understand what they're doing? The world is being set up right now for the greatest deception it's ever had. We've already had two great major revolutions the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution. We've already had many, many other revolutions Nicaragua, Cuba. In Africa, they're going on all the time. All of the Far East. What about the countries in Europe, the satellite countries of the Soviet Union? Then we've had World War I. We've had World War II, haven't we? They're ready for World War III. Why in the world would Mr. George Bush, President of the United States, not relent in any way but continue to tell Saddam Hussein you must leave, leave Kuwait and even when he was willing to sit down and negotiate would not do it even though he appeared to he had to start that war be here tomorrow and you'll find out why let's go on a few minutes longer the leaders of the Illuminati realize from the beginning that in order for them to gain control over the masses of individuals, they must gain control of the colleges, universities, and schools. So they decided that they needed to start what was called foundations. Out of these foundations, they would grant money to colleges and institutions. In return for receiving these grants, then they would have to follow the policy and take the textbooks which they paid their writers to put in print. Therefore they began little by little to change history. United States history, world history. 
They began little by little in the 1930s with the progressive educators that came on the scene, the John Ruskins and other people, to begin to change our textbooks and the minds of our young people. Over in England, something else happened. A man by the name of John Ruskin came on the scene. He had a great impact. And he preached one-worldism. He said they had to take it all over the world in all the British colonies if the, the British colonies and the Commonwealth wanted to survive. A man over there bought it, hook, line, and sinker, by the name of Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes then, with others, such as William Sneed in England and Mr. Milner and Astor of England, set up their own program for world government. And they worked in cooperation with those in the United States of America. Mr. Rhodes set up scholarships by which very enlightened and intelligent individuals could go over to Oxford, England and go to college. They could be trained in one worldism. They wouldn't at first, but then those who had a propensity toward one accepting world government would then go on and be taught the secrets of what was about to happen. Meanwhile, here in the United States, Mr. Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, set up a educational board. This educational board was to give money to institutions, teachers' colleges, so that they could train the teachers to go out in society. He actually told in writings of his disciples that he trained what they were trying to do. They said they had to change the minds of the neighborhoods of America. So change the minds that they would become docile. They would not think for themselves. And therefore they would be easily molded into the new world order that was coming. All these things were found in his letter number one, occasional letter number one, of the Rockefeller's General Education Board. It was issued in 1904. As we go on into a little bit of history here, Professor Progressive Educator John Dewey became the leading figure in the United States in the overall plans to change the neighborhoods of America. Others were a Mr. Counts, Ruggs, and Kilpatrick. All of these men were one world socialist and yet they were the pioneer thinkers of our educational system in the 1930s. They actually published books. One of them was by Dr. Harold Rugg called The Great Technology. And he told us outright that he was working for a socialist state. And that's why they now have a cabinet post in the government of the United States called the Educational. Why? because it's in the Communist Manifesto. They had to have free education for all people, paid for by the government, so the government could tell what was to be learned and what would go into the minds of the individuals. I'm going to apologize because I'm going to have to skip over a great deal of material, but we do have much of this in other tapes and so on that are available. But I wanted to bring us up to the early 1900s to set the stage for my message tomorrow. In 1908 and 1909, the Carnegie Endowment <coughs> stated that they had to do two things. Number one, capture the education of America. Number two, they had to capture the machinery of politics in America. That would be the State Department. So they set about to train people for that very purpose to be able to engineer ways in which they would take over the government of the United States. In 1912, a man was elected as president of the United States, Mr. Woodrow Wilson. He was a president of an Ivy League college. He had no personality, but a man came along who took him under his wings. His name was Colonel Edward Mandel House. Mr. House was cooperating with the international bankers of the day, the Rothschilds from England, Kuhn Loeb, international bankers here in the United States, Jacob Schiff, the Rockefellers, 
the J.P. Morgans, and all the others that now control the Federal Reserve System. So in a way, Colonel House was the right-hand man of Woodrow Wilson. In 1912, he wrote a book called Philip Drew Administrator. In this book, Colonel House stated that he dreamed of America one day being a government as dreamed of by Karl Marx. Socialism. Now, with this in mind, he also helped Woodrow Wilson to get the United States of America into World War II. Now, it's very interesting. After World War II ended, the League of Nations that was mentioned in Philip Drew Administrator, that book, was proposed by President Woodrow Wilson. Now, it looks like if he had any imagination at all, he would have taken another name other than League of Nations right out of the book by someone who said they're a socialist and working for a Marxist government in America. But he didn't. He used the term League of Nations right out of the book, Philip Drew Administrator. So, the Congress of the United States decided they wanted nothing to do with the League of Nations to get us into a world government. So, they went back to the drawing board. Right after the peace treaty in 1919, representatives from the British government and Colonel House and Woodrow Wilson and others from the United States delegation met. They formed two organizations. One of them in England was called the British, the Royal International Affairs. And in the United States it was called the Council on Foreign Relations. These two organizations were now to take over and begin to infiltrate governments so that by the infiltration of government they could take all key positions in those governments. A man was brought on the scene, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, put into the presidency of the United States. The bankers had had in 1920 a panic to get ready for Franklin Delano Roosevelt's great act. That act was to bring about a depression in America because they could only change the government of the United States if the people were in such distress and turmoil they would call out for a strong central federal government. That is exactly what happened. And so all the new socialistic programs were brought into focus in the United States. And right after World War II, even before it was over, all the Allied forces suddenly were called United Nation forces. There was no United Nations. And yet they already had pre-programmed the American people to, to accept a one world authority that we know of today as the United Nations organization. Now, remember all the way back in 1776, Adam Weishaupt called for a Novus Ordo Seclorum, one world government, new order of the ages. How close are we to that? Are we so close that if you fail to breathe for a second or two, you may enter into that time? We'll discuss that tomorrow. But I promised you that I would make sure you understood something before you left here tonight. I've seen so many times where people come and talk and they never give why these things are taking place. There is a reason. Have you ever heard the phrase, for every cause there is an effect? Cause and effect. Do you know that's true? It really is true. The great God of the universe and His Son, Jesus Christ, have laid down in the pages of your Bible what's about to happen. It is going to happen. And there's a reason for it. Now, I don't want anybody to take me wrong. You can go and sign petitions all day long. You can do it. It will do you no good unless one thing is done first. I'm going to read it to you. 
and leave it to you as to what to do with it. In Isaiah of the Old Testament, chapter 24, I want to read you some very startling statements. And there will be no doubt in your mind as to the time setting of this. Then I want to tell you why it's happening, and then you think about it. Verse 1, Behold, the Lord makes empty, or the earth empty. Have you ever read 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 to 4? Do you know what that says? It says, The Lord that brought Israel out of the land of Egypt was Jesus Christ, the Savior of the church. Do you realize this is Jesus Christ before His human birth stating the problems with the world today? It says the Lord, that's Jesus, makes the earth empty. How is He going to do it? Empty of what? Population. Why? Is He doing it? No. Satan is going to do it. Because Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 18 to 20, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. If Jesus has all power, Satan has none unless it's given to him. Amen. Notice what Jesus says, verse 2. And it shall be as with a people, so with a prince. The word priest is a mistranslation. It's the rulers, the average person and the governmental rulers. As with a servant, so with a master. There is something that's about to happen on planet earth that's going to affect every person. You and I are going to be involved. Drop down to verse 3. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord has spoken it. It's not Dave Smith. I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to tell you what Jesus Christ says and why we see the new world order coming. He says, verse 4, The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. Notice verse 5. The earth also is defiled. Get you a Strong's Concordance. Look up the Hebrew word defiled. See what it means. Polluted. The earth is polluted under the inhabitants thereof. I'm going to stop there just for a minute. I want us now to drop on down to verse 19, or the last part of verse 18. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. The magnetism that holds planet earth in its orbit. Something so awful is going to happen that this earth will look like a drunk person. And it will wobble back and forth on its axis. The earth, verse 19, is utterly broken down. That means it's ecosystem. What about up in the atmosphere now? You've got the ozone layer breaking down, don't we? People are going to be scorched, as it says in two different places in the Bible, with heat seven times normal because of the absence of the ozone layer. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. Why? Why is it going to happen? In the next three verses it tells you the time setting. Verse 23, Then shall the moon be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. It's right before the return of Jesus Christ. There has never been a time in history when any of these things could have happened. Never. There were no discoveries. There were no atomic bombs, enough that would blow up a hundred worlds. Until 1954, when the Soviet Union and the United States both had nuclear weapons. And today, a hundred worlds could disintegrate. Now let's go back, and I want to tell you the reason. Then I'm going to leave it up to you whether you will do anything with it. I hope you've seen, by what I've said tonight, I know there is a conspiracy going on in the world. It is Satan the devil and his henchmen who are using human beings. And the day will come when the living God is going to interfere and change it.
because the gospel which is taken out of the churches today is the good news that the true God of heaven will set up a kingdom on this earth and it will never be destroyed. There will never again be sin. Thank you. Now I want to give you the reason why all these things are happening. In the middle of verse 5, remember I stopped. I'm going to start with verse 5 and read it. The earth also is defiled or polluted under the inhabitants thereof. Because they, the human race, including Christians, have transgressed the laws. What laws? Do your homework. Prove all things. The word laws, when you get a Strong's Concordance with every word in the Bible and the definition of it is Torah, meaning God's law, the Ten Commandments. Notice what else it says. Because they have changed the ordinance. What in the world is an ordinance? You've got to do your homework. Do Christians have great celebrations every year? Is the greatest of all called Christmas? Do you know that it is the worship of the Son God in Freemasonry? It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Nothing. The ordinance, it says, they have changed the ordinance. Look it up. It's the holy days found in Leviticus 23 that gives the whole plan of salvation of God because none of the churches live by them and even know they exist. They don't know what God's doing on this earth. And then it says, and broken the everlasting covenant. I have personally run a survey. I've asked 1,000 people what the everlasting covenant is. One told me. These are Christians. One, they didn't even know the word everlasting covenant was in the Bible. And yet, do you know in Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21, the very reason why the Son of the living God came to this earth was to shed the blood of the everlasting covenant. Church people don't even know what God's covenant is. That's why the world's going to hell and don't know what's wrong. They don't know what to do about it. It's repentance. Find out what the everlasting covenant is and live by it. If all the world would do it, peace would break out today. Without it, there will be war. It's inevitable. It cannot happen any other way because God's law is one of cause and effect. If you don't want war, you live by you shall do no murder. And the only way to change it is not like socialism, take people out of the ghettos, put them out on the farms. It's not changing the economics. It's changing the heart and the mind of man by the Holy Spirit of God. 